joining us right now, also a serious person, James J. Carafano, Vice President for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation, a pretty serious place. Uh, James, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. Let's uh, talk about that last statement from Senator Cotton. It's a big one that uh, basically China allowed this virus to spread deliberately so that there would be cases worldwide and they wouldn't be blamed for it. Is is that a fair statement to make? Well, here's what's fair to say. There there are two things that China did, which really almost ensured there was going to be a global pandemic. One was they knew the disease was highly infectious and they let millions of people knew that leave the country that guaranteed that the disease was going to spread that's a fact that's indisputable because they even shut down internal travel in china but they still have to open international travel the other one is that um they knew that this was a highly communicable disease and for weeks they withheld information from the world health organization the international community of how the disease was actually acting we couldn't even really start to think about our response until we were getting accurate information from countries like Taiwan, uh, uh, South Korea, Italy, and Spain. That's when you see us really ramp up our efforts because we knew what we were dealing with. Before then, the Chinese didn't tell us. Now, those are facts. Now, and those are acts, those are not acts of omission, right? Oh, geez, we just, we forgot to call the World Health Organization. How could that happen? Mm-hmm. They deliberately withheld that information. Now, the intent behind that, I think that's debatable. I haven't seen any intelligence that, that leads us to conclusively say why they did what they did. But the, the fact that they deliberately did that, that's indisputable. And so I, I keep hearing from many politicians that, you know, China, there has to be repercussions. China has to pay. What does that look like? Well, that's a great question. So we have a long laundry, because here's what I think the mistake is. You know, somehow somebody thinks they're going to go sue China and China's going to write him a check or something. I mean, forget that. But this is, it's not like China just woke up today and say, hey, let's screw with the world. You know, what the heck? They've been, this is a pattern of behavior, of mendacious behavior that's been going on for years. And so rather than fixate on the particular incident, we have to deal with the problem which is the way China deals with the international community. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we had an administration that already started down on that path. But I think is, look, you you got to figure out how and why you want to do business with these people. And so uh, we have a long laundry of things economically, politically, militarily to think about. So uh, the the economics, the simple ones are always the best. And we have, I outlined three. I did this in a piece for Fox News, just real real super quick. One is transparency. We, we've either forgotten or we ignored or we weren't looking or we didn't care about what China was actually in the slave labor camps, the, the concentration camps, the, the lying, the cheating, the uh, corruption, the bribery, the, you know, all that stuff. Is it fair to say that we uh, is it fair to say that that uh, at the uh, federal government yeah. level, but also at the corporate level, we knew it was happening. Oh, we, we, we just ignored it because, well, it was good for business was at the global level, really. And so number one thing is transparency. The United States government, NGOs, private sector, other countries, we all need to be honest and clear about what the Chinese are doing. We need to tell people about that because it's very, very difficult to do ugly, nasty stuff in the light of day. It's easy to do it in the dark. So I think tra- bring the more global transparency to what, we, what China's doing domestically and uh, internationally, I think it's hard to it make it harder for people to do business with them, harder for people to do bad things with them, uh, and and that'll bring enormous pressure. So that's absolutely number one. Number two, and I think this is the biggest one for me, is people say, well, what can we do so we can force people to stop doing business in China? And I would turn that on its head and say, dude, what are you doing to, to make sure people can do business here? The number one way to bring business back to America is to make it easier to do business in America. So if you're at the federal, state, or local level, ask yourself why Why can employers not get the employees they need? Why is it so hard to open up a business? Why does somebody have to register? Why do they have to be credentialed? Why do they have to pay this thing? So let's let's give people reasons to do business in the United States. And the third one is we don't have to do business with China. I mean, we can buy toilet paper from China. Who cares? But we can buy cheap stuff anywhere. If you took India, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, and rope them all together. That's a bigger industri- That's as big an industrial base as China. And we can do business with those people. And I think we were just lazy. It was just easy to do business in China. It was just the allure of China. And we need to get serious about what, why don't we do p- business with people that we want that are that we want to do business with.
And I think if we just did those three things, China would hate that. But, but, but literally, they would be pounding on the desk of the public or screaming that, well, what the heck's going on here? People are actually doing business with people who are like them and they like, and they're not just giving us money for free. What's wrong here? I, I think that that more than laws and everything else, if we just did those three things, we would crush China. James A. Carafano is the vice president for national security and foreign policy at the Heritage Foundation. And, and all three of those uh, items that you just laid out there are, are business decisions, corporate decisions, but they have huge national security implications we're learning now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and they all they cherish the free market. They encourage p- free people. This is, I think this term is coming back. You're the term the free world. Mm-hmm. I, I think that term's coming back, and here's why. At the end of the day, what's the difference between us and China? We believe in human rights. We believe in the free market. And we believe in popular sovereignty, government by the people. China doesn't believe any of those things. So people around the world that really believe in that stuff, they have to realize if we don't band together and protect that, we're going to lose it. So, and, and the best way to protect that is let's do business with each other. Yeah. And, and, and uh, James, the, the time when the free world uh, phrase was coined, uh, there was this, this quaint understanding that what was good for the Western world, what was good for the free market economies of the, of the Democrat West, and I mean Democrat with a small d, not the party, right. uh, th- that was good for the world, it was good for the free people of the world, and by the way, that was good for our national security. As we've seen our economy get shut down across the board for the last four and five weeks and our uh, the oil prices plummet the way that they have, uh, it's, it's never been more true, right? This truly is a national security crisis when you see our economy crash the way it has. Right. I mean, you, you, the only, if there's a good news, uh, not that it is good news, but that everybody in the world has really you know taken a hit on this including the Chinese. And I think if anybody, the, this is very, very deadly to the Chinese economy because their whole, their whole mantra is based on constant growth. Yeah. They, were, they were having slowing growth even before this. This is a dagger in their heart. And if people start doing business with other people, that's uh, just death to China. So, uh, so then sp- thinking about what we're doing here at home, and I know that you just recently published a column about this over at, uh, at Heritage Foundation, nat- nationalinterest.org, the blog there. Uh, you, you specifically said we've got to get open and we need to be on top of this and get back into the leadership position that we have in the world. Uh, what are your recommendations on how we do this in a well, smart I- way? Well, okay, so there's a bunch of yahoos that say we have to sit in our houses for the next two years. They're, that's, that's ridiculous. And then there's a bunch of people say, let's just go back to business and let people die. Well, that's ridiculous. So, so once we take the stupid and ridiculous off the table, which <laughs> eliminates like 90% of the people in the White House press room, then we sit down and say, well, look, let's look at the two realities here. We have to get America back to business. We have to fight the disease. How freaking hard is that? It's like saying, we have to defeat Japan. We have to defeat Germany. Oh, geez, doing both is hard. Oh, yeah, tough. So um, we can get this country back in business, uh, and we can still fight the disease. I think testing is a large mythology. We're going to be able to do enough testing to stay ahead of what we need to do. If you look at these different phases that we, that we need to go through, when we get to those phases, there will be sufficient capacity of testing to do that. Uh, we don't have to test everybody in this country. That's just nuts. Um, and, and we have to figure out smart ways to open things up. I think what the governor of Georgia doing is exactly right. It's very prudent. Uh, I think what other governors are doing is smart. And so we established this National Commission of Heritage. We brought together 17 smart people from around the world. And, and, and they're, this is the kinds of recommendations. They've got a website. You can look at it. These are the kind of recommendations they're talking about. Let's figure out the smart way to start to open stuff up because we just have to do that. We just can't do this forever. And everybody in the world is starting up up again. France is going to open up on May 11th. Uh, Italy's talking about opening up. We just can't be closed for the next two years. I mean, people just need to wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah. And by the way, uh, with regard to uh, uh, France and and Germany and and European nations, uh, back to China, there, it, it's not like it, this is just you know uh, American yahoos here uh, getting upset about China's role here. That there's we're bordering on international condemnation and unanimity on our uh, anger at China because Europe is is right in there. And by the way, African nations are feeling the brunt of it as well, aren't they? Absolutely. So Europeans, I talked to a, a, 
European official today. He goes, you know what we did? He says, for decades, individual countries, we all ran around courting China. We all wanted to be China's buddy because everybody thought there was a paycheck in it. Yeah. And what China did was brilliant. They played us off against one another, and they didn't let us as Europeans do anything. They have, they have bled us dry for a decade. That's got to stop. I'll give you a good example, just real quick. The United Kingdom was going to allow the Huawei, the Chinese telecom company, to build part of their 5G telecom network, even though everybody pointed out all the security challenges and everything else, that we think the UK government's going to change that decision, and they're going to kick the Chinese out. I think that's a, the sign that people really are kind of getting this. Even in, in Africa, for example, one of the big news stories in Africa is, is look at the way Africans in China are treated. They are literally discriminated against more than the worst racism that we saw during the South African apartheid um, because they're Africans. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. And so I think the world, I do think the world's waking up to this. But then again, you know, I'm an optimist. Yeah, I am too, and and I like to think that that this could be a turning point here. Um, and and I think that that people are rightfully angry, James. But I but you also wonder because our president, and I support him at many turns, but he does like to make a deal, and and it seems like he's still talking as though China is, you know, oh sure they made some mistakes, there's a problem and all that, but he's still talking like he still wants to make a global deal with them. Maybe now's the time to play some pretty tough hardball with this. Oh yeah, I look, I wouldn't pay look, he does that with every everybody he talks to that he's got to do a deal with, he is nice. That's just the nature of how New Yorkers negotiate deals. The reality is is this president, I think more than any other global leader has led the charge in, in the get tough on China strategy. And the U.S. policy is tough on China, and it's tough because of the president of the United States. So I wouldn't put too much in stark of that. Yeah, he, we, we're going to trade with China. Everybody's going to trade with China. That's not the point. The point is, is are you going to let it get away with behavior that is harming your national interest? Mm -hmm. This president's not going to stand for that. He, I, he's been very, very clear on that, whether it's South China Seas or getting ripped off on a trade deal or intellectual property theft. You know, we can be friends with the Chinese all they want. We can do all the country, kind of but they, if they're coming after our national interests, this president's not going to stand for it. He's been very clear about that. James, can I get you to comment on the uh, little flare up today with Iran in terms of these, we've seen these, these uh, boats that are constantly buzzing right. American warships and the president's uh, announcement today, rules of engagement, pretty clear. If those boats come near you, just uh, blast them out of the sea. Uh, what's yeah. happening there? Um, I, not, mu like, not much. I mean, we've seen a little bit of this from Russia, a little bit from China, a little bit from Iran. I don't think they can take it very far because they're all struggling dealing with the disease as well. On the other hand, a little of this for them is just fine, like China arresting the, having the dissidents arrest in Hong Kong. It it plays well domestically. You know, we're, we're active, we're pushing back and everything. It's a bit of a distraction, but they can't do it, do much with it. So would I be surprised if some Iranian boats came out and picked a firefight with the United States and we blew them out of the water? And no, I think Iranians would be happy about that. They could turn, they could start, you know, calling about the great Satan and burning things. And maybe people would forget they're all dying from COVID. But beyond that little dust up or scrap, I, I don't think the Iranians can really, or, or will take it anywhere. James J. Carafano, Vice President of National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Good to talk to you today, sir. A lot going on, and I appreciate you hitting on all of it. Well, thanks for having me, and you got the awesomest show out there. If awesomest is actually a word, I'm not Awesomest, sure. absolutely. It's actually on our, it's my, my, my business card, actually. Larry O'Connor, awesomest. <laughs> awesomest, awesomest show. Thanks for having me. Larry O'Connor, KABC.